Тешка битнича на манега на ран обчера шеджундер. Тешка матната перна кога да манега ме екшегри олва. No translation accompanies that. Bert isolated phrases he liked, wrote them out phonetically as he heard them, and recorded people with distinctive voices delivering them. The words, he writes, were a mixture of mock Tibetan, Kalmyk, and even a bit of Native American Lakota. The principal contributors formed a somewhat poetic roll call, Kozi Unkov, Lama Kunga Jr., Lama Kunga the Elder, M.K. Nepali, Kendup, and Ditri Daza. A woman named Adil Krums provided Wicket's voice. And yes, even Graham Babadka, the matriarch of Iwakis, can be heard in the film. Bert says, one of the favorite recordings we got from this elderly Chinese woman was a little song that she sang, which you'll hear as they pass the firewood. It's probably based on some Chinese folk song. I really don't know. Notice how she's gone from Kalmyk to Chinese there, too. Um, that scrap of song is sung as Ewoks build a fire to roast Han Solo. And just listen closely. <laughs> Whatever her song means, uh, it's mixed into a, the historical and Pulp Fiction motif of cannibals attempting to cook heroes for dinner. To my knowledge, uh, no one has cried foul over Grandma Vodka. Writing last year for the Mongol American blog, Michael Aaron Rockland says, anyone who has seen the Star Wars movies has heard Cal McSpoken. Um, sure, you know, we've heard bits of it and imitations of it, but we haven't understood it. Having one foot in post-colonialism, I can't help hearing Gayatri Spivak asking, can the subaltern speak? Uh, I'm not going to make the mistake of trying to speak on behalf of the woman we know as Grandma Vodka. I know nothing about the Kalmyks and their language, and I wouldn't dare to pretend otherwise. Uh, Bert is very upfront and unabashed about his own lack of knowing, and it's important to acknowledge that a post-colonial reading doesn't line up neatly. The Kalmyks were not colonized by Americans. Furthermore, no one has claimed to understand Grandma Vodka or the power dynamics surrounding her role in the making of these films, which was to inspire a fictitious language that sounded exotic and foreign to Western ears. In his methods, Ben Burt, who hears sound in ways most people do not, consciously put himself in a position of hearing without understanding. Following his subjective sense of elderly women's voices, he went about poaching her recorded voice in an act of unintelligible appropriation. In explaining his method of using her voice to create an alien tongue, Burt outs himself as an alien to Kalmyk. I don't for a second believe that Bert and Lucas set out to exploit a little old lady from northwestern China for their movie about stormtroopers and teddy bears, but uh, it could also be argued that the construction of Iwakis was at least insensitive. And what fascinates me most is that this subaltern can speak, and she did speak, and we can hear her, but we have no idea what she's saying at all. I can't find anything indicating the stories that she told Ben Burt have been made available or translated. After Return of the Jedi, Lucasfilm produced two movies that featured Ewoks, The Caravan of Courage and The Battle for Endor. The first film opens after the Tawani family's star cruiser has crash-landed on the forest moon of Endor. Mom and Dad are promptly abducted by a terrible giant called the Gorax, Mace and his sister Sindel become the Hansel and Gretel of Endor, wandering into the care of the Ewoks. Their host family is the Warwicks, Deej, Shodu, and their children, Weechi, Whittle, Wicket, and a baby. Wicket, of course, is the iconic Ewok from Return of the Jedi. Wikipedia, this is where I have my beef with Wikipedia, claims these movies take place prior to Return of the Jedi, but I reject that outright. <laughs> um, if that were the case, Wicket would greet Princess Leia in English and there'd be no confusion about cooking Han Solo. Uh, prior contact would also explain why the Ewoks don't try to roast the Tawani children. Uh, so these movies must take place after Return of the Jedi, despite no reference to the Ewoks' fight against the Imperials, uh, no burned out bunkers or vehicles. Caravan 
is interestingly uh, narrated by Burl Ives, best remembered by me as Sam the Snowman in the 1964 stop-motion Christmas special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The adventurers gather for a traditional Ewok ceremony. Before they depart, Logre must bestow upon them the sacred totems of the legendary Ewok warriors. He explains the Ewoks' use of skin gliders and medicinal trees, the village mystics' rituals, etc., giving the feel of old PBS documentaries in which an American or English narrator described the customs of people living in various jungles. In a similar way, the Ewoks are presented as xenoanthropological specimens, introducing to a young target audience our own tendency to study other cultures. And along the way, Sindel teaches wicked English. His first sentence is Star Cruiser Crash. Sindel's older brother Mace, who's in that whole 14-year-old um, ethnocentric phase, um, he tries to ruin the lesson here with a bit of racism. What were you guys talking about? About the star cruiser and the crash. Come on, Sindel, get an idea. You can't talk. You can talk. Talk, talk. Boy, the star cruiser. <laughs> Mace, uh, he goes on to call them walking hairbrushes and animals. Uh, no, they're not, Sindel says. I like them. Wicket is the only Ewok to learn English. Sindel and Mace never learn any Ewokese. By the beginning of the Battle for Endor, Wicket is the only bilingual character, an Ewok squanto. After marauders kill Sindel's family, she's rescued by Noah who's played by Wilford Brimley. And she leaves her adopted Ewok family for life with the Quaker Oats guy. Wicket, given the idea of leaving with her, says, no, Ewok live here, Wicket's family here. And so, Heidi of Endor is restored to the care of a grandfatherly miser, presenting a narrative in which blonde girls belong with old white guys, while aliens belong with aliens. It's a reversal of the farewell ending in E.T., the extraterrestrial, uh, where in E.T., separation is fueled by the urgent threat of serious danger. Separation in the battle for Endor comes because the shipwrecked humans have finally found a way to leave. Goodbye, not good, Sindel says, but she promises to come back and visit Wicket as soon as she can. E.T. and Elliot share no such promise. The live-action Ewok films all present the idea that judging others as inferior and oneself as superior is hazardous to everybody involved. Imperial weaponry is brought down by timber. The insufferable teenager finally learns that Ewoks are equals, not animals. The archetype of the noble savage is employed in a liberal effort to humanize the hypothetical other. It's interesting that Ben Burt turned to the language of a people he describes with words like tribesmen, primitive, and quasi-nomadic to cobble a language for an alien race designed to be symbolically primitive to American audiences. He did not turn to a language from the West. His sense of Kalmyk as exotic is, if problematic, at least honest. Of course, Kalmyk wouldn't have sounded exotic at all in the ears of the woman known to us as Grandpa Vodka. In Bert's artistic game of telephone, most of the original Kalmyk has likely been rendered into gibberish. Had the rap taken with Kipsang Rotish, the Haya man from Kenya, been taken with the Ewoks actually speaking Kalmyk, we might wonder what implications that would have brought. Perhaps a globalectic reading of Star Wars as a global text is appropriate, a method Gookie Wathiango encourages. Quote, like a mirror or a camera, a work of art may reveal more than consciously intended. Works of imagination refuse to be bound within national geographies. They leap out of nationalist prisons and find welcoming fans outside the geographic walls. But they can also encounter others who would want to put them back within the walls as if they were criminals on the loose." End quote. These films, made in England and the USA, are part of a series 
that has found international success and grown into not just a franchise for Disney to purchase, but an accessible mythology recognizable to people around the world. We can't reduce Ewoks to mere allegory for American foreign policy. And what do the Ewoks reveal about the primitive other? Uh, not much about so-called primitive cultures. They do, however, embody and in evoke anxieties we have about our own progress that we would rather leave unconscious.